So I, I was encouraged to uh, to give a kind of an overview about the mathematics we use in oil industry. Uh, and that's quite broad, actually. M myself, I am a mathematician, uh, I s but I left academia for the industry almost 15 years ago. Uh, and that, I have to say, it's been a fantastic journey. I've had lots of fun. It's, uh, I can, actually, I can hardly imagine any applied mathematics that is not of interest to the oil industry. So for a mathematician, it's been really fantastic. So with a 20 minute talk, of course, that's gonna be, I'm gonna try to the best of my capabilities to give you an overview, but uh, I'm probably gonna fail utterly. But I still, of course, many of the slides are gonna be quite superficial. So I hope that you will ask me some really tricky questions afterwards. Um, I, I really appreciate uh, being uh, uh, put into a corner with difficult questions. Of course, OPM, now Otger has given you a very good overview of that. Uh, OPM is something I really feel passionate about uh, because the oil industry has not been very open traditionally and OPM is an attempt to try to do something about that. We have a lot of challenges computationally uh, and these challenges, uh, we see that within the oil companies, we don't really have the resources to, to tackle them fully. Uh, by going open source, uh, we might be able to actually solve many more of these while there still is some interest for oil in the world. Um, Otke gave you an overview. I can also mention that we have, a, we have a couple of other efforts also in OPM that is not as vis yet very visible. Uh, you, you will find uh, also a framework for uh, fracture modeling there now. Uh, you will also find uh, a, a framework for pore scale modeling. And um, uh, lastly, we also have some uh, software coming for uh, uh, studying uh, core flooding experiments. So, scientific visualization. I, I noticed that uh, part of you was mentioned yesterday on a number of occasions as kind of a uh, main tool for, for this uh, uh, MSO, 4SC project. Uh, and uh, of course then one natural question would be uh, why, why don't we use part of you? Uh, why did we start all over again and uh, implement this insight? <laughs> so I think that's a very fair question. Uh, uh, there is uh, at least two answers to that. Uh, one is that uh, Pyraview is, uh, it appears to be the uh, jack of all trades, but the master of none. It tries to be kind of too much to too many people. Uh, whereas uh, what we needed was something that would be compelling to reservoir engineers to work with. Uh, and part of you was, I mean, if you just look at the user interface here, you see it's very clean. If you look at part of you, you will see that uh, half of the top is covered by buttons. That's going to confuse users because it tries to kind of solve everything. Uh, still, part of you is, was not capable of solving what we needed. It didn't support the file formats we had to support, uh, and it didn't really have the functionality we needed. Uh, also, it, uh, it resembled an open core project. Seemed like it was kind of tailored to make some proprietary adaption to whatever you needed to do, and that was not what we wanted to do. We wanted to have a fully open source project tailored to exactly what we wanted it to solve, and also then uh, to make it a success uh, among users, which is how it has become. It's really been an extreme success. Reservoir engineers pref now increasingly prefer it over the expensive proprietary alternatives, regardless of price. And these kind of softwares, they are really expensive. And that, I think, is one thing that is very nice with the oil industry. It actually, it has put a price on mathematicians. Very few people in this world is willing to value mathematics. But in the oil industry, mathematics is really valuable. And it really creates 
uh, uh, business cases. That I think is really fantastic. So Rest Insight, it was an answer to a very specific problem. Uh, we were able to simulate on models the, that uh, with Eclipse, the old Eclipse simulator, with models with more than 5 million cells, but uh, the workstations we had at the time. And if you ever wonder where the, who buys these expensive NVIDIA Quadro cards that cost a fortune, uh, look no further. Uh, that's the standard equipment in the workstation in the oil industry. Um, but even with a top end hardware, so these workstations easily cost you 10,000 US dollars a piece. Uh, even then, we had, uh, with the propriety of years, uh, we really could not visualize the results. It was too slow. If you try to turn the model around, you could go and have a cup of coffee while uh, the computer was thinking about it. Uh, so that the, was the problem we wanted to solve. So I find it kind of amusing that some oil companies are using Terra cell models. I have no idea how they are able to look at the results afterwards, but uh, they may have some fancy visualization also. Uh, it is inside. Uh, by the time we had it finished, uh, the first version of it, and that was a year or so later, uh, we were easily able to visualize 20 million cell models on these same workstations. So because of its, uh, its design for performance, it's also now become a very important tool for, um, for looking at uh, multiple realizations. If you want to do real uncertain models, you need, you need many realizations. And trying to co-visualize them is really a hard challenge for, for visualization. So. Now I'm talking way too much about visualization. I need to move on. Uh, Geomodeling techniques, I mean, if you ever, uh, I thought, when I went to school, I had some geography with some geology, and I found geology very boring. But when I came to the oil industry, I found out that geology is really fascinating. It's a, fa a fascinating field where there's a lot of action, actually. I thought rocks were kind of dead things, but they're not. They were created at some point in time by a process. And these processes, they give rise to very advanced uh, mathematical and statistical methods. So if you want some turbulent flows, sure, turbulent flows, you, you, if you want to model a depositional process for a rock, you have a turbulent flow. Uh, and it can get uh, basically as complex as you want it. If you want some advanced statistical models, uh, where, where you want to condition to all kinds of data, uh, that's your geomodeling framework. Um, and this is a place where we don't really have succeeded with open source software yet. We're still uh, confined to very expensive software packages. And this is a very important part of the pre-processing. So that's also mentioned as part of the MSO4 SC project, that the pre-processing tools. But I think for the foreseeable future, for reservoir simulation, it's just not uh, feasible for this project to be able to provide a full suite of pre-processing tools. Uh, I would love to attack that problem, but I'm not sure when uh, we will be able to, uh, to get to it. Otke mentioned upscaling, uh, the more general problem, homogenization, which is a huge field in, uh, within uh, differential equations. Uh, and it's, it really gives rise to some uh, very, uh, very interesting mathematical problems. Uh, perhaps some of the most fascinating ones is when you go from the microscopic scale to the macroscopic scale. That is, if the, the real flow physics, it happens in a, within pores, it's a porous rock. In the single pores, you, if, if you want to govern flow there, you have basically Navier-Stokes equation. But uh, when you go to the macroscopic scale, as you saw, we have Darcy's law. So through the upscaling, you basically, your physics change, your laws of physics change. Uh, one, of the, um, one of the parts there I really find fascinating is uh, something called nuclear magnetic resonance. Most people know it just as MR, 
because in hospitals they don't really like to have the nuclear part explicit. People don't like to know that they're being radiated. <laughs> uh, but we use that as a measurement tool. Uh, so there are also some connections. Uh, there are several connections to medicine. Uh, and there, if you go to the pore scale, uh, if you want to model the, the process of NMR, uh, you basically have a Brownian motion. But if you go to the microscopic scale, uh, you basically you have a Fredholm equation of the second kind, which is as bad as the integral equations gets, really. So a, a, a very, uh, very tough inverse problem. Of course, system OPDs really gave you the full ground course of the, of the fluid flow. This is just a 2D section from a field. Uh, so uh, rather than talking more about uh, the, the, the system coupled system of PDs, which is of course, it has given rise to highly specialized methods like Atke, uh, like Atke showed you some of. So, so it has grown into a whole field in its own right, really. But also based on, uh, based on the simulations, we, we want to cover uncertainty. And that has given rise to uh, advanced uh, conditioning and optimization methods. So these days we're trying to handle an ensemble of simulations. Uh, and that there basically you've seen two competing methods to condition this to the da available data because they, they're really a zillion unknowns. And if you, go to, if you go to the field of statistics, there's basically two methods that can hel help you. If you have a large number of unknowns and a large number of data, that's Markov chain Monte Carlo and it's ensemble Kalman filters. And both of them have been highly studied in the oil industry and been competing for, for uh, uh, usage uh, as a history matching tool for ensembles of simulation models. Um, and that's where you can see also these methods really put through the test and you can see where they fall down. And uh, right now it seems like the ensemble Kalman filters are really fallen down. They have been replaced by something called ensemble smoothers. Basically, the, 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 what you, when you start to work on real data, you, you see that the real data correlates too heavily. And these updates you do, periodic updates you do of ensemble in an ensemble Kalman filter, you, you assume too much information on the data. It turns out that this data you have over time, it's actually correlated over time. And to handle that, uh, 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 you basically you have to go to the end of the simulation. You can't really do the updates all the, all the way, unless somebody comes up with something more clever than what exists today. So the answer has been a, a method called Ensemble Smoother. Uh, both of these are now uh, actually already implemented in a commercial software package. Of course, I would love to, for it to be open source, but it's not. Sorry, it's extremely expensive software package called Tempest Enable from one of the software vendors. So this, uh, this could be one of the areas where, where OPM or somebody else could step up and, and provide an open alternative. We, we also now see a huge focus on optimization. So what that's going to uh, amount to, uh, I'm not sure. But, uh, but uh, this is optimization, of course, is uh, if you have the uncertainty modeling, it's natural to go the next step and look at uh, if, you, if you have all these uh, realizations that uh, that represents the uncertainty of your reservoir model, it's natural to also use them for optimization studies. And this gives also rise to the basically the toughest optimization problems you can imagine. We do advanced laboratory measurements. I, um, I did mention NMR. We could call it NMR in the hospital. It's called MR. Uh, you, we also do the CT scanner. So that's the picture on the left there. It's from a core plug, which is the diameter of that is about two inches. So you see a flooding there. You see the water coming into the core plug. Uh, you see it prefers to go 
to the bottom of the plug. I don't think that's gravity really. It's probably just the fact that the, the flow property is, uh, is worse on the top of the plug. Um, on the right hand side, uh, you can see a picture of another plug, a uh, cross section. It's done with an electron microscope, uh, which allows us to really zoom in down to nanometer scale. Uh, we, also, uh, we also push the technology for industrial CTs, because the medical CTs, they, they can give you the kind of resolution you see on the left there. But we want to see really each pore, we want to go down to nanometers. And then we need a, a kind of x-ray source that you, you would never use on a human being. Um, uh, so we're pushing the limits there too on what uh, you know, computer tomography can deliver. And, and that also gives rise to interesting uh, mathematical problems. And my impression is that the uh, oil industry today they really don't have the resources to work on that. We are kind of relegated to whatever is uh, uh, finished products on the market. So uh, we could use some more collaboration with academic communities, I think. Of course, mathematics of sound, that's also a discipline in its own right. The restaurant simulation, that's, uh, that's a discipline in its own right, typically called restaurant engineering. Mathematics of sound, that's what usually is called geophysics. People take their PhDs in that field. It's a very rich field with many problems and, uh, and also give rise to a lot of interesting mathematics. Uh, the, the, first, the first thing you do from a seismic survey is typically the migration, and that's where we see the HPC really coming into play today. It's a, it's a big consumer of uh, high performance computing today. And the migration is basically, you, you, when you do the seismic, you, you detonate an explosion and then you have microphones, typically dragged after a boat, that records the echo from the explosion as it hits the underground. But of course, that, that's going to just going to be a time series of uh, sound. Um, the process of migration is to, to, to place that sound to s sound signal somewhere in the underground. You need to know where that echo comes from in the underground. And that's the process of migration. Uh, and that, uh, I mean, on that problem, you throw as much computing power as you have. And that's where also the graphical, the GP, GPU has had some success in the oil industry. Uh, we have put up full clusters to do the migration. But the migration is not the only place where interesting stuff happens. Uh, once, you, once you have the migration done and once you have put the field into production, uh, you also want the inversion. That is from the, from the sound signal, you want to say something about the properties of the reservoir. Uh, the, the Typical property that the sound cares about is elastic properties. So that's your typical inversion parameter. If you do a 3D inversion, you, you invert from the sound signal and to the elastic, proper, uh, elastic properties of the rock with fluids in it. Uh, and there you, you, you need your wavelet analysis. We've had huge success by transforming the full problem into the from the time domain and into into frequency domain, so that means we Fourier transform the whole thing. Uh, and then you need as fast Fourier transforms as you can get. The sound signal itself is typically modeled as a wavelet. So there you go, all the typical wavelets you've seen, we do use them and we also try to estimate if wavelets that really match the, your sound signal. Probably spending too much time here, but uh, uh, as long as Sultan is not interrupting me, I'll take whatever I get. <laughs> so uh, we have, uh, of course, well measurements. And that's really where I feel, I feel I've kind of failed. It's, a, it's an area where I've tried to really do something. Uh, but I feel that uh, at least I haven't been able to make much of a difference there so far. Uh, it's really fascinating. All kinds of measurements are done. In the wells, they're called logging tools. 
uh, we should probably feel kind of bad. We do all kinds of bad things. We electrocu electrocute the reservoir. We radiate it. We do all kinds of bad things to it just to get some knowledge. Because we don't really know what's down there. Nobody has been down there to look. Uh, we can, of course, drill out the core. So that will give you the diameter of the well, the rocks from the diameter of the well, and you can have a look at those. But uh, to extrapolate from the well and into the reservoir, uh, you really don't know. You can, of course, use whatever geological competence you have to try to understand how the geology spreads out. But what you really want to also know, of course, is how much oil is there, how much gas is there, how much water is there. Uh, and then uh, the basically the only, you know, oil and gas, they are made up of hydrocarbons, molecules. Basically the only hydrocarbon indicator we have, more or less direct indicator, that's electric conductivity. Because hydrocarbons don't conduct. And if, if you don't have hydrocarbons, you typically have uh, saline water. And saline water is highly conductive. So that's why electricity is very interesting to us. Uh, so we have a whole range of tools just to measure the electrical conductivity of the reservoir. Uh, two basic classes, they are called lateral logs and induction logs. The lateral logs, they do the easy thing. Basically, they, they, put, in, they have, uh, put in an electric current and just measures the how much electric current goes from one point in the well to another one. Of course, that has been advanced multiple points by now. But, uh, but perhaps more interestingly, you have the induction logs, which uh, induces an electrical field. And then basically, you have to solve the Maxwell's equations. And ideally, you would want to solve Maxwell's equations on a 3D representation of the underground. Because as Otke showed you, it's really a three-dimensional object, this geology. And it's, when he says heterogeneous, it means the properties really vary drastically from one cell to the next. And just solving, just for a very limited meter times meter model with a heterogeneous rock to solve Maxwell's equations is a very hard problem. And uh, right now, uh, we hardly even get to see the specifications of the logging tools because that's typically uh, trade secrets for the vendors. So it's more a fundamental problem. I did mention NMR, which, gives, uh, which is the Fred Holm equations you see here. Uh, we've been um, on the NMR logs, we've been more uh, fortunate, we have more knowledge about them, so we can do more of the modeling, and, and we have done so too. But unfortunately, they are not part of the standard logging suit. We also have sonic logs, which measure sound. We have neutron logs that uh, measure uh, ra uh, basically radioactive measurements. We have gamma ray logs, which has a passive reading of the uh, gamma radiation from the underground, and a number of other logs. For the future, I have to. I probably have to first say a disclaimer. Uh, the future is uh, not set. Uh, I don't think th anybody can give accurate prediction about the futures, uh, about the future. But of course, that doesn't need to prevent us from trying. So at least, uh, if it's not a prediction, at least a hope. I hope the future is open source. I strongly believe it is. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I really like this project. Uh, and I also hope that hope open source can be an enabler to see a much faster technology development than what we have seen uh, the last uh, 30 years. That was all I was. Planning to say, I'm, I have no idea how much time I've spent. <laughs> <laughs>